Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Smoke and Tire Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Vredestein Tires. Vredestein is a tire brand you've probably heard of, but they're just launching in the U.S. But you've probably heard about them like casually, like, oh, yeah, it's like that brand, right? Do you know this brand, Vredestein, has been around for 112 years? It's been around almost as long as the production automobile. The tires are all made in Europe, and they've been sold really, really successfully in Europe for 112 years. Uh, They've got some UHP tires, but really, they're all about the all-season performance, and it's about all kinds of weather, right? So you want your ultra high performance tire, but if it rains, you just don't want to be driving around on like a slick, right? They've got UHP award-winning lines that cover every season and an incoming all-terrain tire called the Pinza. They offer the widest size range of ultra high performance tires available in North America with all season, all weather, winter, and pure summer tires. Their newest product, the Hypertrack, is made for North America with the really cool uh, Giorgetto Gijaro design uh, sidewalls. They offer market-leading wet weather performance, handling, braking, and hydroplaning for premium cars. They sent us a set, which we just had installs on Young Zach's M3, and we're going to be making a video with how we feel about those tires on the E46 M3. Uh, really, really soon. I really like how the uh, the sidewalls look on his M3, and I really like how it would look on a Jajaro design car. It would really match that styling super well, especially for your 80s and 90s cars. Um, the Sprint Classic is that tire, right? Modern performance with period correct styling. And then you have the Sprint Plus, which is a high performance tire for like recent late model classics from the 80s and 90s. That's what you want to put on your let's say, Isuzu Impulse. You feel me? The Vredestein line is available uh, from Tire Rack, wherever you get tires, and be sure to follow Vredestein, V-R-E-D-E-S-T-E-I-N, tires, Vredestein tires on the gram, and look for some upcoming Vredestein uh, SponCon on this week's podcast. We are also brought to you by Lemonade Health. Guys, this episode like many others, is brought to you by Lemonade Health. Check in on your health. Use the time to check in with a doctor. And I know we don't all want to go into doctor's offices. I think it's a little weird to be hanging out in doctor's offices right now myself. That's why virtual medicine is what's up. Lemonade Health is a virtual medical office providing you with affordable health care but without the need for insurance. Our medical team can treat anything from erectile disease dysfunction, to anxiety, depression, insomnia, hair loss, high blood pressure, and more. It's, and, and you do it from your own home. No waiting rooms, no being around other people, just straight video chat. Virtual, it's great. And here's what's going on for you listeners out there. Lemonade is providing Smoking Tire listeners with 50% off your first order of any ED medication. Getting started is very easy. Visit LemonadeHealth.com slash tire. And that's spelled Lemon A-I-D, not spelled like the beverage. Lemon A-I-D, like help not like the drink. Fill out the online questionnaire and their medical team will review and get you medication fast and discreetly. Delivery is fast, free, and comes in discreet packaging. Visit LemonadeHealth.com slash tire for 50% off your first order of ED medication from Lemonade Health. And of course, we are brought to you for this entire year by Tradecraft Farms, the official ganja of the Smoking Tire podcast. They have an ill Instagram. If you're in California and you can buy their products at retail, I would strongly encourage you to do so, either at your favorite local dispensary or at one of the Tradecraft Farms uh, official uh, retail locations, like their new one in Port Wainimi, which I am told is the correct pronunciation. If you're not in California, or even if you are, you're an Instagram user, be a good fan. 
And uh, follow Tradecraft underscore Farms on Instagram for your boy Matt because this train has to keep on rolling. These guys are keeping me in deliciously dank nuggets, which on their Instagram, which I'm looking at right now, uh, they have beautiful macro photos of. Seriously, whoever their photographer is, I respect them. I respect them greatly. They respect their craft, just like the people growing the trade craft. Give them a follow at tradecraft underscore farms on Instagram. Okay, folks, on this episode of the show, we have a crew show talking about the most recent vehicles we've driven, our interesting experience with the Mach-E. We've got the Ferrari Roma in the house. We're talking about that. And the homie Michael O'Neill of the Wrench, that's R-E-N-N-C-H, like get it, like Porsches, uh, Wrench YouTube channel is calling in to tell me about this insane build he's doing uh, by putting a Subaru engine into an old 69 911S. Michael O'Neill of Wrench and the crew on the Smoking Tire Podcast. And it's picture in a picture. It's the fucking Smoking Tire Podcast. What's happening, everybody? Welcome to the studio at what has been a uh, very anxious day for me. I don't know why. Could have been a combination of caffeine and ganja. But I had something of an anxiety attack around noon. Deter- I was certain I had COVID. Certain. That combo always gives me an anxiety attack. Yep. And I was certain I had COVID. And I went to get a test at the place I always go get a test. Shout out to Exer, Marina Del Rey. You guys rule. My orthopedic surgeon does some hours, some shifts over there. And she was on staff and site today. And saw me and said, why are you here? And I said, I'm having an anxiety attack. I'm sure I have COVID. She's like, do you have any reason to really think you have COVID? And I was like, no, but I am having an anxiety attack and I think I have COVID. <laughs> she's like, okay, I respect that. And she's like, I'm, here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to run your test just first, just right now, just pretty much right now. And I'm going to call you directly with the, with the results. So, I, we, you know, bypassing the normal channels. And, um, whew. No COVID. She called. She's a saint. Thank you, Dr. H. You are a saint for calling me and letting me know that there is no COVID and the anxiety attack can end. Hey, Mike. Hi, Matt. <laughs> ah, nice studio you got going on there. Michael O'Neill. Thank you. Wrench. With, this, is the, uh, this is my wrench lab. I yes. respect your lighting. Your lighting looks very nice. You've got a foreground Thank and you. a background really nicely uh, defined. You've thought about this. This is good. I have. I've got LEDs all over the uh, garage. I've got colored LEDs for when it becomes time to like uh, get, you know, get kind of oh, like bro. smooth. I got yeah, blues you like and disco reds. It up and... a little bit. I really like yeah. where you're at. Yeah, no, this is excellent. I've, you're a p- true professional. I've got uh, this whole wall. So what I did, the reason I moved to Long Beach, and this is a true story, is that uh, I had opportunity to get this four car garage, which then I moved here. COVID happened. I moved here just in time to never leave my house. And then I spent a couple hundred hours in this garage doing the floors and doing the walls. It's got a 5.1 surround sound system. It's got an entire video wall. So this whole wall is a movie screen. And then right what? there above me, oh, it's the right there above right, me yeah. is the receiver and projector. So, uh, and then you can't see this, but I have a robot bartender on the other side of this laptop, which works like a Keurig. Yeah. So you put, for you booze, put a cartridge right? in and yep. So when we're allowed to like get together again, do you put like uh, bottles of booze on the back half and then the yeah, the so, pod is like the flavoring for that? Just go yeah. Get so that. there's four, there's four <laughs> bottles of booze. Good. Yeah. Yeah. That you put in here. <laughs> they and look you, like you Nalge- Yeah. They're Nalgenes like of booze. Basically <laughs> they're four, four Nalgenes of booze. Yeah. They're, they're glass, yeah. but uh, this one is labeled vodka. So you have vodka, you know, whatever. And then, um, yeah, you stick a, a cartridge in and, and it, by the way, spits out one of the greatest old fashions I've ever had. And this is, I've had complete and utter whiskey snobs. Like you and I are pretty whiskey guys. 
they're like, damn, that is a really good old fashioned. So like they've done it wrong. Well, work. listen, the robot, it's, you know, but it's, it doesn't have that human. <laughs> what's the criticism, right? There's the no panache. human it doesn't error, have the panache. Right. The guy doesn't like yeah. sneer at you. <laughs> you yeah. know, he right. does it like what we really want is like a, a robot bartender that like bounces the bottles off its robot elbow. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, it's you know minus I mean? all the snark and the hipster. It's minus all that. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh no, um, Zach! I made the Zach idea. My phone in the background. Is it my press car, Zach? Was it or not? Oh no, I think it's gone wrong. The idea. Sorry, Mike. This, there was. He was like how he was struggling back in the corner. It was very distracting. Uh, the idea is. The idea is when we can get together again, I'm going to get together with my car buddies. And, you know, a couple times a month, we sit and watch car guy movies on the big wall and we drink whiskey and we have a, a, a gay old time. That's I think the plan. in the meantime, what you do is you just get a bunch of robot bartender buddies and just you and them, just six of them, uh, uh, <laughs> sit them uh, around a long uh, table uh, like this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. It's a good, oh, it's that's a good point. It's I've had one get together, uh, socially distanced, uh, and we've done a little bit of that, but not, this is, has not been what I had thought. But in the meantime, I, you know, I sit around and I uh, hang out and I weld on a car. So that's what I've been doing. It's I went to fun. a drive-in uh, that was, frankly, something I don't miss. The, the romance of the drive-in and the reality of the drive-in, yeah. really not the same. I mean, unle unless you're rolling like a Bentley... You know, something, because they've really made movie theater seats fucking nice in Los Angeles anyway. It's not and like you can have a home days. theater at your house. That's For great. Sure. We're working on that. Uh, um, I can help with that, as you know. I but, know. Um, you have, the, you have a, a hookup. The, um, uh, uh, there was a comedian that was doing a drive-in, and they were charging like $220 per car. And I'm like, I'm not going to pack into a car with three other people during COVID for three hours and watch your comedy show. Well, look, first off, so, almost any car is less packed in than you would be at a comedy club. 100%, 100%. Comedy clubs 100%. are the most well, packed true. in that you true. could be anywhere ever. Good point. Um, is it the one, the ones at Magic Castle? I think there was a run of comedy store of comedy shows in the parking lot of the Magic Castle, which you're new to L.A., so do you know what Magic Castle is? I have not been there, but I have heard of it. Yeah, it's like a it's like a venue for magicians basically in Hollywood. It's pretty cool actually when you can do that sort of thing. But they were running comedy in the parking lot. Eliza Schlesinger was doing shows and oh, uh, Bert was a doing tour, some like a shows. National tour to, to drive in. Oh yeah, Bert did a drive in tour. Like, yeah, tour, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I talked to Segura who did a couple of drive ins too, and he said uh, he said it was kind of weird, but you know better than nothing. Um, I get I it. I did a dating I did, show I a, pilot. <laughs> I would say again. I did a dating show pilot with Eliza Schlesinger. It oh, was really? a Howie Mandel thing. I didn't get picked up, but <laughs> was she, neither she, did she. Was she the? Uh, she was the hostess. Oh, she was the host. Oh, host. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I she's like a her. tiny she's little great. human. She was super funny and awesome. I uh, I like her comedy a lot, and I met her in the back of the comedy store with Joe Rogan, and I think it was only because I was with Joe Rogan that she gave me more than eight seconds, but. Um, Joe gave me a very complimentary intro, as he does very well, and all of a sudden I was someone worth talking to for about 60 seconds instead of 10, and it was, uh, it was very nice. She was very sweet. Well, she was very, and she's very tiny. She's very tiny human. Yeah. That's uh, what I remembered about her. Yeah, and, and actually quite hot in person. Uh, what, uh, tell me about this, this half apart and pretty beastly looking Porsche project over your <laughs> right shoulder. Half assembled is the more uh, accurate. True. Glass half full. Sorry. Because it was a. Uh, so what this is behind me, this was a. Uh, this is a 1969. For those of you who are audio only, um, people will be audio only, right? This is the podcast, yeah. right? Yeah, we're okay. it is, but we're you know we we yeah. started like 10 percent audio or video yeah. when we first started it, and it's it's actually creeping a little bit. We're getting more and more. Uh, of people, people who are uh, into the video, but assume, oh, interesting. assume it is audio only for sure. Well, um, 
This was a, I've been thinking about, this is kind of a rewind to rewind to rewind, but I want to open a, uh, a wrench retail store where it's full of really cool bits. Think like period correct meets DIY somehow, where it's got just got this vibe. You can hang out and listen to those Kef LS50 speakers and drink some whiskey and, and watch the cool videos on the wall. But to do that, I wanted to get proof of concept that the idea was sound. To get proof of concept, I wanted to build an audience. To build an audience, I decided YouTube was the way to go. To build an audience on YouTube, you really need a build or like something consistent yeah, content-wise. Yeah, yeah. You need a hook. So I thought, I want to do a car. It's, I, haven't, I did this gray car behind me in 20, it was, it was uh, 2007, I think I painted this car. So I'm 14 years into this thing. Gray, by the way, first gray, thank you. Uh, I'll take all that commission, but um, <laughs> yeah, you really, so, you really has started primer. You, you really yeah, started exactly. the yeah. flat gray. I'm no. the original. I like um, that anyway. Car. That gray car is really is really nice. I go go on uh, go on Mike's Instagram, which is is it just wrench on Instagram underscore yeah underscore. Underscore. underscores on both sides, right? Underscore Somebody has R E N N C H yeah. underscore, and yeah. his gray car, which uh, which we see out at the old the old C's and C's. Is, uh, yeah. is quite good. It's a fucking good looking car. Thank you. Yeah. It is, the, you know what? It, it's the purest mobile. So this has a 3.6 from a 1995 uh, 993. It's about 300 horsepower. It, it's it got a, a 731 ring and pinion from the, the 72 911. So first gear is almost unusable in it. Like it is just a That's ripping hilarious. It's got it's car. First gear is like the, uh, like the off-road gear what? in the 959 basically yeah. So yeah i can basically start it in second but yeah. third gear in this car is porn like it is absolutely torquey and so when, you, when you're in the mountains in third gear it's just spectacular um anyway so i wanted to build uh to me it felt like these cars had become a little too precious in the last you know five years and when i was a kid and i had porsche posters on the wall you could buy these things for you know a couple, whatever, you know, I, I paid five grand for this shell, for this gray one. Um, and so I wanted to build and to build my YouTube channel. I wanted a long term thing because that gets subscribers interested. I found this car on Craigslist. This is a 1969 911 S that had been completely converted to a almost tube frame race car. So fully integrated roll cage, coilovers front and rear, 935 rear suspension, camber adjustments front and rear like it had all the things yeah and i thought wouldn't it be cool to make um in my mind almost like a formula one concept where it's like this is all prototype stuff that if it works it's going to filter down into you know the rest of our line so the concept is if if i can get something that would come on like a 2022 mercedes s-class and they make it for the aftermarket, and I can integrate it invisibly. I'm doing it on this car. Like, just don't use their dashboard. What? Like, what? Give like, me an example. <clears throat> like a 14 inch digital dash from Hall Tech. Um, but I can put vintage gauges on it. You know what I mean? So it'll have all my stuff. Um, I think like, like do, you think uh, want, for, do you think people want that? For the get, the do you dash? think people are like, you care. know what sucks about this old 911? Gauges. We should have a screen well here. the fact that i'm doing twin turbo um and i have all kinds of different things to i didn't want to put a bunch of analog gauges to to monitor monitor the stuff that's going to be going on in here uh-huh um here, let me get through it and then you can poo poo because i knew you hate it but i will i will let Whatever, me get through the, right, the stuff fine. i think is kind of cool okay um rear view mirrors that look like regular rear view mirrors but inside them are cameras and so I've got a rear camera, two side view cameras, but in front of them is clear glass with mirrored window tint. So you never know there's a camera behind there, but I'll have modern, you know, backup and wide angle viewing and things like that. Um, I'll have, like I said, twin turbos, kind of look 935 style with, with little peekaboo turbos Where in the back, like which will be kind of fun. a ball sack on a dog. Like Busy's. Like you can sort of see him. Yeah, there's <laughs> yeah, a little yeah. ball sack. Which I think yeah. is kind of cool. Little, no, that's, yeah. that looks cool. Yeah, that's a cool look. Yeah. Integrated 911R taillights, um, but there will be new LEDs. In fact, this company, I've got them kind of uh, on there right now. What are they called? Lauren, Lauren Teal is doing these really cool 
like integrated lights. Um, I really want it to be like smart enabled. I would love to be at a cars and coffee and be like, um, I can't say the A word because my whole garage is smart. But like, or let's say, hey, Siri, it's getting hot in here and all my windows go down. Like, wouldn't that be sick? <laughs> Just for fun. It's all SEMA I hate all and fun. Ideas. I hate every single one do. of these ideas, Mike. I know you these do. These all would take do. a car that I, I would know. spend extra money to not have any of them in and but then put this shit in. I know. All right. I'm I well mean, aware. I, okay. Okay. Keep, keep going. You <laughs> Keep at it. Let's see. What else do I hate about this car? <laughs> Here's the thing, though. This car will be 400 plus horsepower for less than five grand into the power plant. So yes, I'm into. I mean, you so can go you, into so, it. oh yeah. So you're talking about starting with an engine and then putting five more grand into it. Or you're talking about starting with no engine and building a five thousand. That's including engine. the engine. The engine was eleven hundred dollars. And it's what engine? It's the Subaru Z30R. Oh, which oh. is the flat six engine that was mm -hmm. co-designed by Porsche. And uh, it starts at the stock version is 240, but once you put a like a hall tech on it, it's really 300. And then it and that's eleven. It's eleven hundred dollars. Okay, and Three. and then you put turbos on it too. And how Doing twin turbos. Like how yeah. how close is it to an actual Porsche engine? Have you ever have you ever seen someone put this engine in a in a car before? Does it sound and feel like a Porsche engine when you're done? Is that is that something you can dial up, Zach? This is this is a question that I had planned for. Uh, dial it up. Sorry, say that question. What again. do we look? What do you need to dial up? Can you no, Google? Can you oh. dial up that that link that I sent you earlier? The link Zach? that you sent earlier. I can't play it because it's a YouTube video, and we'll get pinched for copyright. Yeah, you can't play no YouTube on the YouTube, um, man. I could capture it really quick. Even if it's just a sound, it doesn't no. matter. Mm, oh, oh actually, man. What, well, the sound maybe. Might work. The I don't sound know. Might work. I don't know. It's we just might, a sound. It's not like a, it's not a song. Tens of dollars in it's revenue. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not a song. It's not like no. Miley it's not about so No, it's not. It's it doesn't not matter. Here we go. It's YouTube. It's YouTube clips. Yeah, the YouTube likes like. Uh, I, w I just won't show the video, thing. but I think the sound will be alright. This is. Yeah. Oh, so this is the uh, sound of the engine. I mean, yeah, it, that's it's. It sounds. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess it sounds. Does sound like vaguely Porsche esque. I think it's pretty. Zach thinks it's pretty think Porsche like. The revs, it sounds like a GT car to me. <laughs> I think it sounds pretty nice. Yeah, it sounds pretty nice. I think it it's sounds like close. a GT car yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah. When you take apart the engine and you are looking at the, you know, the actual, I've never seen one of those engines out of a car. Does it look like a Porsche engine? Not only does it look like one, but there are Porsche part numbers on the engine. The fuck out of here. Like what? No, it was co-designed by Porsche. Well, but are like so, are there interchangeable? Does that like mean an, there's interchangeable parts with the 911? What does that mean exactly? I don't. I've I've not taken it apart. I'm uh, going by professional people that do it. But um, if I think you can think of it like an SC motor with VTEC and variable valve timing and all that kind of stuff. So it's got quad cam. It's got uh, all the everything you could tune on an engine. It kind of exists. So it's kind of a modern platform. So imagine if they built an SC motor today. That's kind of like it's a pretty cool hack. Happened. I gotta say, I wasn't. I mean, that's expecting interesting. That. Yeah. What's the weight difference between the engine that came out of that car it's, and the engine? It's sixty-five pounds lighter than the uh, Porsche motor. Oh, than uh, but, the you know, one but that it, came I mean, in a sixty-nine, or than the lightest ev version of it, like a three-liter. They're both oh, three-liter. Wow. Like if you look yeah. at the. I have a little comparison chart that I did on one of my YouTube videos. They're, I mean, they're almost precise. They're almost exactly the same, um, but this is a little bit lighter. And um, you know, by the time I add the turbos on, it's back to being, you know, pretty close. But yeah, uh, do you but know I don't know. The, I mean, for do you about know if the, the weight, inside of the engine can handle the boost of turbos. I'm right oh. at the edge of. Oh their, boy. So I, yeah, so I'm basically like, they say the internal to take about 400 horsepower, give or take. And there's plenty of people that have done that. Uh -huh. uh, but if I were to, now I'm running almost no boost. I'll be running like six pounds of boost or something crazy low. But if I decided to like really do it, this, this is capable of seven, 700, I think 750 or something like that without, wow. but you got to build it. Yeah, 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 but it's not—it's not like the Porsche engine, where 
Is it like the Porsche where the case and the cylinders are like separate? Like where they're like individual cylinders like that? Or because it's a water cooled engine, you don't have to build it like that? You don't have to build it like that. Okay. Because you don't need the air cooling between the cylinders. Right, like that. right, right. I realize that probably sounds very dumb to a super nerd, but like to me, I don't know. I've never seen, I've never seen one fucking yeah. apart, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, but I mean, look, cool, whole thing's, it's, the whole thing's been super fun. It's an experiment. And um, what gearbox are you using again? I'm using the uh, G96 from a 996. Oh, oh, well, that's, so, that's kind of so, good, actually. That might, that might work nicely. So I have a custom adapter plate that I'm going to be selling. Um, and that one, so the, the goal is to first make an engine cradle for so some kid finds a 912 at a junkyard and wants to do something before while he's building his $40,000, 180 horsepower Porsche engine. Um, and he wants to drive it around. So I have an engine cradle that's going to bolt up to factory mounts. Um, and then this, this adapter plate will be for people that like have a 996 or a Boxster or a Cayman that maybe blow the engine up and they're sort of like, can I do something else? And you'll be able to buy this engine for 1100 bucks on eBay or wherever you want and, you know, put the adapter plate on and roll. So that's the plan anyway. Well, that's interesting. I mean, it certainly yeah. is interesting. Is there, what is involved in terms of like fitting all the other shit? Like, do you get power steering? Do you get, you know, can you get the accessories to work or is it really just the bare engine? Well, no, I mean, if I wanted to, I could run all of that stuff. It's got like AC, room, it's got power room steering. There's room in there for all that stuff. Like, I don't know. I don't know where the bracketry I, I mean, I, I goes or off. anything. I took it off. Like I have it. It's, it's, it's a beautifully packaged little engine. Um, but I didn't want to run power steering. I'd rather keep it, you know, analog, uh, despite the fact that I'm going drive by wire with the pedal, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and hydraulic for the clutch. But, um, one of the cool things is it's cable shift. So instead of that, um, having to run like the, the rods. you know, cause people that do like Roo conversions, you have to put the rods outside of the tunnel. Like they're they're high. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. I actually so think I've that really... looks kind of cool, like a like a spiker. If you finish the rods yeah. right, yeah. it can right. look kind of neat, you know. But it forces you to put that work in. Yeah, and you yeah. you don't have a choice. Yeah, yeah you gotta yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's kind but of a chrome though. plate, my rods. Well, um, but, but if you're talking about a six speed gearbox too, that's 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 different mm -hmm. for a you know, for a car uh, that's that old, you know, that's, that's a big difference. Yeah. And a busy, busy wanted to set, uh, set me up with a GT2, uh, 996 GT2 full setup. And I said, how funny would it be to have like a, a Momo prototypo with like paddle shift buttons <laughs> on it or something, but you know what I mean? Just to really yeah. irritate the world. Yeah. But, uh, no, it's, it's going to be cool, man. I'm, I think, uh, I think it's going to be a cool build and when it's done, then you can feel free to critique all you want. I just don't, you know, I don't, I don't, um, one of the things I like least about new cars is the constant the presence of tech that feels yeah. like it's creeping more it. and more into my life. I mean, Zach and I, I get it. Zach and I just, uh, did, uh, the Mach-E, uh, for, for a week, which overwhelmingly was a fucking fabulous vehicle. I mean, really well executed by Ford and nice to drive and the range estimates are spot on and it was made well but um I, they over teched it a little bit i mean they over tech yeah. uh, in the same way they over tech other things uh as well you know um, more tech, was, i felt more that about the land rover uh discovery my, my friend just got a new a brand new discovery and it's uh -huh. It was almost intimidating to drive. I'm like, I, I didn't really like the rear view mirror because it was all camera and no right. like actual mirror. So you couldn't kind of move left and right and, and see yeah, where you weird, were. Isn't it? The rear view mirror a little weird. screen is weird yeah. as fuck. I've driven multiple GM vehicles that had that and I've disabled it immediately. That's why their execution yeah. is great because you can disable it and it becomes a mirror mm -hmm. seamlessly. Yeah. That's really, really good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I yeah. didn't see that. That's cool. Yeah. You can. So hopefully I can do something like that with mine if I decide to go that route. I would like to be able to switch. You should back pair and all forth. that wonky shit you're doing with the center seat driving position from Busy. You can ah, have him convert yeah, totally. that shit to to drive totally. fucking go all the way. I drove his uh his boxster that was center seat. She was killer. It was crazy. I mean, it was yeah. really nuts. It, when I drove it, I would say that it was not fully refined and dialed in yet, and it was mildly ragged and gnarly. Um, mm. 
and also uh, I hope he. I think he's learned his lesson by now. I don't know about a lesson, but like he continuously chooses to use manual brakes in cars, and I just I hate that. I, I he builds these insanely right. fast cars with these manual brakes, and he says it's for feel. And I'm like, I have to stand on this pedal to stop this death missile, dude. Come on, help me out. Formula One car. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if I were you, I would definitely use. I heard you say hydraulic. You say hydraulic brakes, or hydraulic clutch. What do you yeah, say? Yeah, yeah, hydraulic clutch, hydraulic brakes. Yeah, It'll yeah. the brakes. He's already got. Um, again, this thing was built as a race car, so it's already got a dual master cylinder with brake bias, all like oh, fully cool. set up. Yeah, so it's really Were you able it's, to it's salvage kind of, a bunch of shit from what was done yeah. before. Yeah, and I've had to undo a number of it just to get stock body panels back on because it had it had a nine nine three GT two body <laughs> kit on it. Did it, it was fit like kind fully, of like wonky and weird? Like, like the no, it was old... gorgeous. Really? No, no. You did the guy, whoever engineered this car, first of all, way over engineered it. It's got like the roll cage. It feels like it's made of like one inch thick tubing. But um, the uh, it, it's, it's so well done. You could tell that this guy was a real, he passed away. So what happened was, it's kind of a cool story. It's, it was father and son that built the car. They own a, a, a shop uh down kind of near me the guy was this master fabricator dude and so they built this car and then they got into a falling out so it ne it's never been outside so this thing was done in 1994 and it's never been outside it was brand new so all That's the fabrication sad, was isn't done. It? yeah That's so it sat sad. for 25 years and then i bought wow. it wow yeah and so you bought it with no engine no engine no trans no nothing i'm oh, working with matt monson i don't know if you know matt yeah, oh. it's the reason I can make it a blasphemy build is because it's got almost no. There's no possibility, first of all, of bringing it back to be a 911s, like zero. But zero 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 two two. That's serial. Crazy. Really? Wow. It's that 20, is a, 20 second off the line. That's early. Yeah. Are you sure? I mean, mm -hmm. is it not uh, 911? I mean, because you're talking about if it was. I mean, you'd have to find the original engine if it existed, but it's just not worth it. And. Dude, when you see what's been the the shell has been so uh, yeah packed. at this point like yeah. you did I mean I was I you know I went through your channel watched some of the videos like you have done real fabrication work on this thing real it, fabrication it's, it's not like yeah. I got a Subi engine I'm gonna bolt it in and hand it off to like <laughs> yeah. a shop or I'm just doing this yeah. like you know I'm clicking through and you're, like, you're cutting up like door panels and making shit fit and then getting rid of rust and doing like didn't you do all metal uh, wide body kit. Uh, well, I did fender. all, I mean, everything you see, all the quarters, the rear, like there was no rear end in the car at all. It was, uh, it was completely gone. So I had to redo the whole rear end. Um, I haven't done the panels yet. I have them. It's actually getting uh, real ST flares, like actual ST flares from TRE Motorsports. Oh, so cool. that, that's going to be cool. Um, and by the way, I'm not the biggest plugger in the world, but I'm 5,000 or 500 people away from 10,000 uh, subs oh, yeah. on my go YouTube follow, channel. Go follow Ren so, on YouTube. If you guys want to follow. R-E-N-N-C-H. If you want to yeah. follow this shit. But I want to know, like, Appreciate is it. the business going to be the parts of Porsche restoration and swapping, or is it going to be, like, lifestyle accessories? Yes. Because you showed me that uh, tool bag thing you made that was really yep. cool. But I don't know. Yeah, it seems like a limited market there. for Subaru adapter plates. God, you'd be you'd be actually really surprised. There's huge Facebook groups dedicated to just this. Really? I think um maybe I'm just yeah. missing out on the Facebook groups. I don't know. Here's don't know. the thing. Yeah. To me, the real money is uh, in the adapter plate where I can adapt the transmission to this engine because mm -hmm. that includes all Boxster, all 996, all Cayman. Right. So that's that whole group. And then right. all people to, that to will be, blow their engines and transmissions sooner or later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and inevitably the, will not be able to afford the Porsche replacement parts because they bought that yes. Boxster for $8,000. If that. Um, it's actually an easier adaptation to do a 915 transmission than it is this uh, 96 because the, there's no uh, mount for the starter on the G96. And there's no mount for the starter on the Subaru engine. Oh. So that's included in our adapter plate now. Oh, there you go. Well, that helps. Yeah. Can you do yeah. like, wait, so what year Subaru is that engine out of? Like, a, I think it goes O, O, 
2 to 09 or something or 11? I drove like a, the like, Outback like and outback. came out. No, I drove it in an Outback. Yeah. I have to tell you, in Outback, it's horrible. It's a horrible. It's a, it was a hard, but it was not horrible because of the of the power it made or anything like that. In fact, I do remember, you know, when you revved it out, it did feel vaguely and sound vaguely Porsche like. But whatever they, whatever Subaru had done with the throttle mapping of it was a complete mm. fucking nightmare. Um, and I, it was probably for economy reasons or whatever. I mean, if this engine was on its last year, maybe they dumbed the shit out of it to make it, you know, pass a mission or something or whatever it was that they did um i hope you can improve that i mean if it seemed like whatever that video you sent sent over he that guy had solved that problem um but uh well yeah there's a there's a tuning shop for subaru they're called out front motorsports and they're uh -huh. here in uh la and the guy so th these things are listed at 240 horsepower so in the outback they're 240 horsepower right the second you put an aftermarket ecu it's 300 horsepower Wow. So Subaru throttles the hell out of this engine. Yeah. I mean, and it must have been uh, it must have been for emissions or something. It yeah. must have been just because yeah. it Yeah. Hey Mike, real quick, will you turn down your yeah. mic input sensitivity like two clicks? You're just a little hot. Yeah. I'll cut that part out of the export. Just go tick tick and then it should be good. Thank you. Was that an audience uh, audience. audience sound check? Audience okay. sound check. All right. Engine audio engineers in the house. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Or I can back it's up so a funny that that the, no, okay. that the H6 engine was, you know, in a, such an unfortunate looking car with the, tri with the Tribeca. Like, so bad. Yo, the Tribeca so was bad. bad. The Outback was a fine car, except it just it just drove badly. Yeah, it, it didn't do anything to improve over yeah. the, the 2.5. Yeah, you know, there was uh, no Ford. reason to yeah. buy that engine because it was, it was tuned so badly. It, it made no use of the extra power. Yeah. Yeah. So, my, uh, by the way, for the record, my mother... Uh, Queen Vivian has just replaced. <laughs> she's she has just replaced the very last Farah family RX three hundred with a a brand new, as my dad described it, quote pea soup green Subaru Outback, which is perfect for my mother, and she apparently likes it very much. They're they're very good at their job. Like, yeah. that car is good at its job. Yeah. but uh. That color description worries me a my bit. Dad, my dad, who has the ugliest cayenne on the planet, has commented with a cringe on his face about the pea soup green. So I think we know which parent you get your color blindness from then. <laughs> Please don't tell Vivian yeah, I said yeah. that. She's very nice. Yeah. No, my mom is, my mom, uh, and she got a blue Q5, so she's coming out of her silver phase, which I really, uh, I really like. Um, Mike, what is uh, yeah. the best place if people want to uh, get... Uh, uh, these parts from you or get involved in uh, in these this build with you besides following you on your wrench YouTube channel the gram the gram is great um, if they want to instantly subscribe is my audio better by the way everybody um, uh, if they want to instantly subscribe they just have to go to wrench.com slash YouTube but uh, yeah man you can do that you can you can email me at wrench me at gmail.com if you want to if you have cool stuff that should be on this car and uh, yeah, man, I I just have to say, Matt, I you know you're you're such a, a such a heavy hitter, and you're such a good guy. You're a good man, Matt Farah. Oh, thank so you, thank sir. You for, thank you for having me on your your. Uh, no, dude, we Titanic. appreciate it. I Yo. want one of those tool bags. Are you actually going to make those things? Because they were rad. Yeah, they are rad. And yeah, I'm going to. He make made them. this tool I'm bag in, that reminded me deal. of. It's it doesn't look like it, but it really reminded me of the shoe bag in Back to the Future Two that he pulls the auto lacing shoes out of. Oh, right. Except it's like for your Porsche tools, and it's like Porsche engine or the frunk. It's like frunk shaped. So if you have an old Porsche, it's designed to fit in between the strut towers of your of oh, your air cooled cool. Porsche. I'm looking for it on his Instagram. It's a very nice. I don't know where can where can someone find? Yeah, do you have any pictures of that? Instagram. Yeah, it's on if the internet. If, if Zach digs yep. far enough, he will find it. Yeah, it's a neat. It might like, actually uh, be on my wrench.com uh, page too, but it's definitely there. It's definitely it's on my Instagram. Fucking cool, actually. I have it in my hands too, but it's well, uh, that's it much easier. Huh, there you go. What? Uh, yeah, there it is. As well, but basically, you put that Blue Harbor Freight Jack in, and you can like unroll it, and all of your tools are in it for yeah, your Harbor it? Freight Jack, and then uh, it clicks, it attaches itself to your strut tower brace. 
uh, here in the oh, back. Oh, that's red. Yeah, that's red. And, yeah, uh, so it doesn't go flying like, when you hit the brakes. It's leather, and you know the inside is that really cool. Um, it's hard to see, but this these are held in by that same material as the Porsche dash. You know the mm. the kind of square weave stuff. Um, yeah, it's cool. That's a sweet it's bag. A, See, that's what I think bag. you should be selling at your place. I think it's. I, I think agree. You're good at those lifestyle goods. When you showed me that bag, I was like, "Oh, I see. I could. I could see people buying this shit." I got. Yeah, but yeah. Maybe. It's true. I mean, dude, if you know, if you know of a thousand people waiting to fucking swap Subi sixes into into Porsches that I just don't know about, stamp them shits out. You make that money, son. I won't knock your why hustle it, at all. Why does it need to be either or, bro? Let's let's do it all. Doesn't. Let's sell it all. You know what I just found for my uh, Ferrari, but I may I may get one for the 911 as well. Is this radio called a Blaupunkt Bremen, which is uh, it's a it's sort of one of these reissue deals where it looks just like it's out of the 80s, except the CD slot is fake, and you just pop the little door down, and it's got a little USB port and a little little USB C right in there oh that's cool it's fucking dope and then you just pop it up and it looks totally vintage crutchfield was sold out i had to grab one on ebay but i'm i'm stoked i did interesting yeah. i kind of wanted one that would like because i do these long targa events in this car i do you know 1500 mile road rallies and stuff mm -hmm. in this thing i wanted one that like could flip out and then uh -oh. play or something would be cool you know but Wait, still hit it again no you want one that would flip out and then what uh, you, you broke like, up it would It'd be like a video screen and you'd have CarPlay or something well, available. They have that. That could, well, but it doesn't it doesn't become invisible again. I want it to be gone. Oh, like fully invisible. Oh, you, yeah, you mean cool. totally gone. So this this has a headless stereo in it. Right. So I, I I've got a marine amp, like one they would use in boats. Yeah. So all it is is a Bluetooth amp. It's a Bluetooth four channel amp. I've got it powering two focal yeah, separates in the which are hidden. And then I've got one of those little square Kenwood subs under the passenger seat. And then the uh, ashtray flips down, and that's the controller for the audio. Oh, that's nice. you Yeah, that's up, perfect. You can't even tell that there's a stereo in there. It yeah, even yeah. Like it. so, that's very good. I like that solution a lot. Yeah. Boats, boats have good solutions for that kind of shit. You yeah. always want to look to and the boat the way, industry for that. <laughs> the sound of the engine behind you is the stereo. I'm like, yeah, dude, go drive for four days and tell me how much you want the sound of that engine in your ears. The Bro, whole time. I don't buy that argument at all. I there, I turned the stereo off maybe for a while in the canyons, but fundamentally, yeah. you can enjoy an engine and a fucking radio at exactly the same time. Anyone who tells you you can't is an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> You're just an say, asshole. I'm almost, yeah, I'm almost drive on always highway. wearing my earbuds. You know, I almost put my like my uh, wireless earbuds in and that's something I drive with a lot. I have to do that in the Lamborghini because the fucking, you know what sucks about that car? The speak, the only thing that sucks about that car, literally the only thing that sucks is that the speakers are blown because they're 30 year old shit pile paper cone garbage, right? Um, but there, there aren't any traditional speaker housings that you can access without disassembling the entire interior they're just Ugh. it's just there's like whole swaths of leather with little tiny perforated holes in it that you'd have to remove and it's like here's an interior that doesn't rattle like just be happy about right. that and put the fucking right. earbud like there's no way that shit's coming apart and going back together right no not a chance and so i'm Touch not nothing. i'm not doing it Touch that's why nothing. i don't have a stereo either that's totally it why don't you have yeah. fucking stereo, Zach? I have one in a box. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long. We'll, we'll talk about when we film my car. Okay, we're gonna let's we're gonna hey, send off. Uh, we're gonna huh? No, I was go gonna ahead. say one more thing that um, having air conditioning in that car is the is the maybe the best upgrade I've ever done in a great car. Is it it's so is it electric or is it traditional just regular Porsche AC? Yeah, it's the classic retrofit. It's that setup that's it's built for the nine eleven. Um, and it's it's bolt in. I, in fact, on my YouTube channel, I did a five video install series of it. But I'll tell you what, man, if you underestimate how much of a big deal it is to be able to shut your windows when you're on the highway. Yeah. A and, and B, when you want your lady to ride with you in the summertime and not arrive with a sweaty back, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, it's like it makes such a difference to have air conditioning in that car. Is that, but it's not electric AC, right? It's on a, it is, it is. It is electric. Oh. Yeah, it's electric. Yeah. 
See, that's so the gotta, one thing. My 911 has the factory AC that works. Uh, well, it doesn't wait. actually. It does work. work? It, yeah, it works. It blows You're cold air. But okay. it it but it, what it does is it probably sucks about 30 horsepower out of the car. Um, right. And I don't care right, about right, right. the horsepower as much as I care about the throttle response, which it makes substantially worse. And that's not the first car where that's been the case. My Mini, that happened, and some other cars, too. But but it's it's pretty noticeable. So I don't really use it unless I'm on the highway. But if I had the electric AC, I'd be more likely to use it more of the time, I think. Well, um, I, th- I want to say it's either 25 or 40 pounds lighter than the oh. stock AC. Oh, that's uh, it's very powerful. That's appealing, and uh, and it works great. And it's built for the G body. Mm, so that's interesting. May yeah. look into that one. Yeah, it's a good. Well, one. I, I, if you are interested, I may have a connect for you. There we is. There we is. Yeah. Thanks very much, dude. I can't wait to see how long. What's your time frame on this this other build? Do you have one? It's just I'm as long for, as it takes. I'm for SEMA. No, I'm trying to uh, SEMA 2021. Oh, so it's not so, a crunch. You have, I mean, it, it'll feel like a crunch when there's still so much to do. Now. Yeah. <laughs> say that before yeah. my eyes are bloodshot for eight days. Why won't these cameras in the mirrors work? Yeah. yeah well, I'll exactly. come fuck with your robot bartender too and hold tools for you while you do things. That's I my that's that. my role in the garage. Hold tools, make drinks. It's really Matt, it. Zach, uh, it's been a little slice of heaven. Thank you All for right, having homie. me. See y'all Thanks, later. Thanks for coming. We have... Uh, follow Wrench. Wrench on YouTube, underscore Wrench, underscore. And, uh, yeah, he's a good dude. Got got us Thanks, some dude. got us some audio equipment here at the shop, some Kef speakers. They're very nice. They're very nice. They're good, right? I, like, I have the remote for you, by the way. Oh, <laughs> we don't need them. I just Bluetooth that shit. Um, okay. But, uh, uh, but the, uh, um, oh, Jesus Christ. I just fully, fully brain farted. I really want one of his bags. So. I got the Ferrari Roma in the garage. Did you yeah, see that thing down there? I did. It's fucking Ooh, good fire. Color. Good color. It's excellent. Uh, it just got here. I've only driven it to a COVID test and back. Okay. You know they make you wait in your car? Yeah. <laughs> what did you and learn there, about it sitting in the car? Um, nothing good. Uh, they've really... <laughs> That's, things you don't learn while... Things while that, stationary. Cars that don't shine while stationary. <laughs> That's a gruddy review. Yeah. Um, you know, it's full It's full screens. It's all screens now. Mm-hmm, yeah. Screens everywhere. Um, so while they're laid out nicely, you know, I lament. I lament. I, you know, I, I, they're, they're laid out nice. It looks nice. You know, um, but it's not so much that it's the screens... It's that the whole shit is capacitive touch buttons now. Like, the oh. start button isn't a red button anymore. Uh, it's on the steering wheel. It's just a glowing, it just, it's just the words start and stop that just glow. That's weird. On a black thing on the steering wheel. So it's like it's like pressing a, a TV remote. That's and, strange. And you have to hold it for a second. And it's, yeah. And then, like, the mirrors adjuster was not a thing that needed reinventing. No. They had you had a you had a button for left mirror, button for right mirror and then a, and a little thing. A little thing. Right. Now you have a, a haptic touch sensor that's a like a touch pad but with no actual buttons anymore. Those things what's hard about those when if you're driving in a bumpy road, bumpy highway yeah. and your finger moves around a little bit. Yeah. Some like like the Mach E if you moved your finger over off the screen, it would still recognize you as operating like the slider on the seats. Right. <laughs> but if they don't get it really good, then then suddenly your mirror is just pointing in fifty directions and blinding you. It's yeah. it wasn't. It's not. It's like it's just very complicated. Yeah. Um. And uh, and uh, so I just don't know why we've had to go this far. This was not. This is not an improvement because an improvement needed to be made. It just was like. I think I don't know. I think they wanted to make it feel futuristic or something, but it just might have gone too far. And I may be being a little mean about this right now because we're still talking about a Ferrari, and the very short drive I took so far was pretty, pretty good, pretty fast, very comfortable. You know. Um, so can you zoom in on that picture a little so bit, Zach? Punching a bit. Um, basically. No. Okay. So so the whole bottom half of the steering wheel is actually kind of a touch bar. 
Oh, um, funky. Yeah. And uh, and what's really kind of interesting is in the middle, you can see this metal ring where they've sort of tried to replicate a gated shifter pattern, but it's just for the buttons for reverse and manual. Yeah. Which are, it's kind of cute. Cool. It's kind of cute. I like the passenger side screen. I don't mind the central tablet. You know, that that I'm not, by, but it's really, it's really the the all new controls on the steering wheel and the, the, the secondary controls such as the mirrors and stuff. Like, I just don't know why that had to be made into some kind of a touch panel. Like, it's weird. I, I actually still haven't, I played with it while I was sitting there. I really still haven't figured out how to get the mirrors quite <laughs> quite right. I mean, did it clean up the armrest in a way that you're like, oh, that is better and more It's not beautiful. on the armrest. It's on the dash no, 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 behind but, the you wheel. Know, those controls used to be on the armrest usually. It was on the right, left side. Yeah. Did that, cause I guess the theory is that if we get screens in there that control more things, we can remove buttons from places that, that had to be there. Maybe it frees up the designers a little bit. It doesn't feel like there's – like when definitely when they went to the 458, and everything went onto the steering wheel, the mm -hmm. main shit. That definitely got rid of a lot of buttons. This doesn't seem like it has less buttons than that. It just seems like some of those buttons were turned into touchpads. And it's not entirely necessary. Mm -hmm. um, I, I expect this thing will drive awesome. And it looks awesome. It does. Here we go. It has $100,000 in options on it. The base God. price is like two fifteen, and this one's three fifteen. Holy shit! Yeah, so it's this, got a lot of options on it. This is the new entry level. Yeah, but it feels like a much nicer package than like I haven't driven Portofino M, but the last California T I drove was fast, but you know that bustle butt, the retractable hardtop. Oh, look, yeah, not work. not yeah. really great. No, this <clears> is <throat> this is sexy. I mean, yeah. obviously the roof doesn't go down, but. It's a very good looking, you know, a Ferrari has to be great looking. Yes. First, you know, great looking, great sounding. Everything else can kind of fall from there. And so it does sound very nice. It's got a great idol. It, sound, it sounds good. sounds a business. I haven't heard it start yet, but it does look very good. It looks really good. Yeah, it kind of looks like what the Vantage should have been. I mean, the Vantage yeah. is cheaper yeah, they, significantly. They, but it's half the price of this one. Yeah. But they kicked. They did kick Aston Martin a little bit in the teeth. Yeah. And it's, you know what? Pencil and paper cost the same in Italy as in England. The options, are, like the options are 100 grand, right, but designing right, the right. car. No, yeah. The, like... Good design is expensive for sure, but we're not talking about supercar versus a Kia entry level. We're talking mm -hmm. about one supercar versus another supercar. Right. You know, the design at that point could look, it can look like anything they want. The, the design in, is not in either case constrained by cost. So we're looking at a, a better zoomed in photo of the dash. So are you saying that the buttons uh, to the left and right of the crest on the, um, on the steering wheel, those are just flat, like haptic touch buttons? Like the cruise control, yes, the phone, those all are stuff. all Got haptic it. touch buttons. Furthermore, the button underneath the crest that says start stop yeah. is a haptic touch button. Got it. The all the the manatino, the red switch is an actual red switch, but everything behind it is a is a digital uh, image. Got it. Um, so, and then if you look at the bottom left uh, corner of the screen, well, middle left, underneath that air vent on the left, mm -hmm. you can see the haptic touch panel for the mirror adjustment right oh, there, right. Which, okay. is, which is weird. Um, wow. So look, am I dwelling on something that if you, if you bought the car, you adjust the mirrors once and okay, whatever. Maybe it's not that big a deal to you. But to me, you know, one of the things that we've learned about my Ferrari 328 it's actually that it's very simple. It is, you know, for all the allure of Ferrari, even of the period, the engine, the transmission, the way the car is actually set up, this is it's all really, really simple. Um and and so we we don't I don't know. I don't want my Ferraris to be all screens. Is that weird? No, I agree. I mean I just drove that, you know, the F eight and and I know that you you've explained like the interior is old on that car because it was carried over from 458, but right. at least I really liked the center tack. Yeah. I loved the center tack. I thought the other screens were clear. They presented plenty of information, didn't look old. 
just having that center tack look nice. Yeah, I love the layout of that car. The the radio was very clunky to use. If you tried yeah. the the, ra- the radio is one of the most frustrating radios in all of cars in the in the F four five eight to F eight, uh, and it's so. But you know, CarPlay makes it better. But CarPlay is a forty five hundred dollar option in the F eight. Um, and I haven't even messed with the radio on this one yet, frankly. I don't know about the radio. I can't speak to that. But I just, you know, it was implied to me that this haptic thing and a full digital gauge cluster with a digital tack is basically the future of the Ferrari interior. That's what I was pretty I, much yeah, told. Yeah, I think that's the future of car interiors. Unless unless someone takes like a bold step and goes the other way and everyone goes nuts for it. Yeah. I mean, there's we've had problems with uh, using touchscreens on the highway and there's studies about how it's distracting and all these other things and like and how long are they oh. going to last versus how long are they going to you know are they going to break sooner than yeah. a button? I mean, well, that's it, why we're starting yeah. to see people manufacturers that are doing this sort of stuck on tablet thing. Mm-hmm. That way, if the tablet has to be replaced, they don't have to take apart the entire dash to do it. It's right. probably just a couple screws in the back, and the thing comes off as one unit. You know. Yeah. Speaking of uh, tablets and touchscreens, right? Quick sidebar. Mm-hmm. I got. I had been in touch with the. Um, FCA folks about the freezing tablet screen on our Hellcat Durango. Yeah. I commented in the video that that thing froze a couple times and required a restart. Um, I followed up with those guys. That actual car had a hardware problem and that entire tablet was replaced. Oh, okay. Yeah. So obviously it wasn't supposed to do that. Um, and that that car did have an issue, and they did replace it. I filmed so. a, a Lusso, was it two years ago, and the screen froze, mm-hmm. and uh, Mark Urbano, the photographer, his heat seater was stuck on for three hours. <laughs> I got locked in a Lusso. Remember That's that? right. I got I got a Lusso, totally non responsive to key, glass roof, San Diego, June HRE open house, probably 150 degrees in the car. I think I was in there for like three or four minutes, and I felt like I was going to die. Full on panic attack. <laughs> Amber Blonigan was in a car with me. She was? Yeah, she was showing it off. She's like, check out my new Lusso. I'm like, get me out of this fucking thing, you psycho. She, and she's like, I know how to fix this. She's like, well, then fix it now. This is, <laughs> really this is your time to shine, Amber. It wouldn't start. The electronic door releases, like it was totally non-responsive to the key. Oh, speaking of non-responsive to the key, should we talk about our experience after filming the mock e video? Yeah, we should. I mean, I was going to put that video up on uh, Instagram Oh, you week. have the video? Yeah. Is it handy? Can you just drop it in the show? Can we just do it in the show right now? Is that a thing that we can we do? We can do that in the show. So we talked in the video, uh, the Mach-E review, which I hope you all saw the Mach-E review. Uh, we were really excited about Mach-E. You guys seem mildly excited about Mach-E. Lots of people really fucking hate that it's called Mustang, and I get that. But guys- You got to get past that. Don't die on that hill. Just just don't. It's not worth it. Um but my uh, my biggest concern with the vehicle was the key a uh, uh, phone as a key, and that's also a concern of mine with Tesla and with anyone else who tries to do phone as a key. I fucking hate phone as a key. Your phone doesn't need to be a key. And as I, I'm pretty sure I talked about in last week's show where we talked about Conrad passing. Right? Didn't I talk about the panic of using your phone as a key? Yes. And the Maki freaking out. Yes, you yeah, did. Okay. So Zach and I are up in the canyons filming the Mach-E, we finish our video, we turn off cameras. Immediately, 30 seconds after that, is the video queued, Zach? Do we need to we just play the video? Uh, keep, let's see, it just got received. Basically, 30 seconds after that, the vehicle refused to recognize my phone as a key uh, for like 10, 10 minutes. And so we're sitting up on top of a mountain <laughs> And uh, the the car won't start. Uh, it won't it won't recognize the key, even though the key is like it's it's you know the the it won't recognize the key. And you can pull up the Ford app and hit the start you know to start it with that, and it would it would say that it could connect to the car, but then it didn't. And so Zach Zach got a little video of it, but ultimately you know because we had a. Uh, some information from Ford because it was a pre-production car, I was able to get someone on the phone who was able to talk me through it, but I st- I recommend using your phone as a key even less now than I did last week in the video. I really don't recommend using your phone as a key. They give you go. a key fob 
and it works just fine like any other Ford. All right, I, sh I shot this vertically because iPhone, and we're going to put on social later. Because Instagram. But, uh, let's see. Let's see if we can get this in. Okay, here we go. It says no key detected. Okay. Here we are on the side of the road. The car it says no key detected. My phone is the key. It's open to the Ford Pass app. It's updated. I hit the start button to try and start it. Nothing. It's buffering. It's buffering. It's buffering. It lets me do nothing. My phone is ringing. The video is glitching because we're also like obviously exporting you know live video while we play this, so yeah. the MacBook is confused. But uh, so and then my phone ringing right there not was the Ford guy calling me. Yeah, um, the, the app wouldn't open, and we were we had cell service, but not enough to like download an app. I think we had one bar. We didn't bring the key with us. It sucks. <laughs> so yeah, we we brought receipts. It doesn't. It didn't work, and uh, so that was frustrating. But but then I put the range video out, and I was able to, without trying at all, uh, literally, you know, get on the highway, point it north, uh, set the cruise at uh, seventy three, uh, air conditioning on, radio on, no regard for saving any of those things. Uh, just using the radar cruise, which I thought was great in the Mach E, and I did. I physically drove 248 miles, and there was nine miles in the in the reserve, so that was a 257 mile range against Ford. You know, says 270, but that would be probably totally flat, controlled mm -hmm. conditions. I went up and down some some big hills, and uh, I used my air conditioning and et cetera, et cetera. Basically, their their range estimates are what I believe you can expect in real world driving, which is yeah, good. Which is very good. Which is good. Because sometimes those tests are perfect conditions in a vacuum, et cetera, et cetera. I know. Yeah. I kind of want a Maki. My back's been, yeah. my back's been fucked the last week and I tweaked it out. It's been fucked. I was supposed to get that Mazda three press car, but one thing does, it doesn't matter why the car couldn't make it here. It's finally, I think here. And uh, I had to drive the safari around, which is fun. I love the safari, but it's not great on my back. No. So I'm just kind of thinking about, and also someone hit Hannah in the van. So the van is going to have to go to the body shop. It's going to be at least two weeks. And you said the van seats aren't great either. The van seats are horrible. I mean, I love that van. It's so fucking cool. My wife loves the van. She thinks it's so cool. Her back has no problems. The seat doesn't give a shit about the seats. I can't ride in it for more than 20 minutes. Yeah. So, so um, we g we're going to have to suck it up and get a regular car between us. Um, so I'm pro I'll probably get Maki -E at some point, but that's not going to be for a few months. Yeah. So uh, I might, I might really take over Alex's, nice. Alex Roy's Model 3 lease. Mm, he okay. asked, he was talking to me today about swap a lease. He's like, I might throw my Model 3 up there. I'm not really using it. I was like, homie. How many months does he have left? 14. Oh, Perfect. Wow. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. If it's got like at least 800 miles a month on it, I'm on it. Yeah. Just to have a little knock around, fuck around car. And that would, probably, would that be a cheaper thing to do than getting the Mach-E lease? Besides well, being you'd available give you just enough time to not be on that first batch of cars. <laughs> yeah, also, very good point. Yeah, very good point. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to come with a warranty, of course, and you're going to want it just because any, any And Castriota, you know, who worked on Mach-E, uh, you know, without blowing any confidentiality, he said, he said, just, he goes, don't order anything yet because you want to try the GT first. He said, the GT... Is really going to be. I mean, the the bones are there as we experience. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. In, in the canyons, the bones are there for a really good car. Yeah. The thing is, you know, if you wait for the next one, it's more time. You need a car now. I know. Also, the GT is going to cost what ten, fifteen grand at more. least. Yeah. So that's yeah, yeah. A, that's a big jump. And does it matter? All that stuff. And doesn't. I don't know. Right? Does it matter? Yes. It's, <laughs> it's going to matter to you because you're going to test in the canyons and go. I do need this. I uh, do, yeah. I, you I drive mean, in the canyons a lot, bro. You once yeah. you test a car with mag ride, you're not going to buy the version that doesn't have mag ride. It's true. That's like a truism. Yeah. I will say the Mach E we drove rode really well. Mm -hmm. I would not, I wouldn't be disappointed if I drove that around. No, no. In, in any condition. It was lovely. Yeah. And fucking 48.5 out the door. Yeah. I'll take that. That's really it's nice. a lot of car for that much. It money. was, yeah. Just don't use your fucking phone as a key. Yeah. Bring the, bring the fob. <laughs> use the regular bring key. Bring the fob. Yeah. 
Um, and so next week I'll get to talk to you about Roma. You know, I drove that McLaren Alva thing. It's um, it's embargoed for a while, so you're going to have to wait on that one. Sorry. I also drove the base model Taycan, which is embargoed, unfortunately, until next week. So uh, I have a video with base model Taycan. It was a um, it was a Porsche. It was, you know, when you drive you drive a base model Panamera or you drive a base model Cayenne, you know, like a really base or a base model Macan, mm-hmm. it's almost not a Porsche. You know what I mean? Well, because the interior experience isn't the same, and usually the handling's not as good. And yeah, the, the, you know, just, they hamstring. It, they all the feel parts. pretty base model. Yeah. Without giving too much away, this this one is more in line with how a base Cayman or base 911 feels compared with how a base Panamera or 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 Macan or Cayenne feels because there is a lot to be said for the platform. Right. I was going to say it's you know, I'm sure the platform is rigid. The, plat- the platform. You can't change the center of gravity with the trim level. Correct. So Correct. Wow. So the so Without without giving too much away. Oh man, this is the second call. Right. Were we done with what we were talking about anyway? We were. Yeah, we can move. We to were. Questions. I think we got questions for some folks. So let's got get a lot of questions to it. Oh boy, uh, Stew Dog saw Hoovy's video in which some guy put fucking skateboard wheels under the front bumper. Did you see that shit? No. Hoovy bought these cheap Lambos. Yeah. Allegedly, saw that. Che- allegedly cheap. Under the front bumper of the Countach, somebody, at some point, installed skateboard trucks with wheels on it. Yeah, in case, of, to prevent in case scraping? Of bottoming out, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Interesting. Yeah. Very stupid. Is it mounted to the frame or the body? I don't know. I didn't watch the, the video. F- I just saw a photo. Frame. But, like, that's dumb as fuck. That car's not that low. It's not a low car. Yeah, just drive more carefully. Yeah, or it's don't. not like an, it's an Aventador. You're, you, like, I've had that car for two years. I've never scraped anywhere. That is not that I low. I think it just speaks to whoever owned that car <laughs> and the driveway Weird. they had. Like, that's just a bad idea. It's terrible. It's probably something that some dealer fucking sold in the late 80s, frankly. that See, now that would be a good story. Yeah. That, that would be funny. Yeah. Cameron Shaw, Appearin, opinions on a 996 Carrera 4 with 65,000 miles, IMS taken care of for a first venture into the Porsche, into the Porsche world. Uh, expectations of appreciation. No! Stop asking when 996s are going to appreciate. Even if they do, you're talking about going from 25 grand to 28 grand. They're not, no one all of a sudden is going to realize, hang on a minute. The 996 Carrera is a $100,000 driving experience. Yeah. It's not going to happen, Th- folks. There's too many other cars they could choose from that look better. Not, and, and in the meantime, not while you're insuring it and maintaining it, right? It's You're never going to win that one. So stop with the appreciation. Having said that, a 996 with 65,000 miles and good maintenance records is a decent first Porsche. I don't like the all the C4s that much. They all the all wheel drive is for me completely unnecessary. Snow tires on the rear wheel drive cars are just fine, but um, if you have a specific use case that really, 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 really requires all wheel drive, I mean really, then go for it. Sure. Caleb Howard says, "I can you Google that reference number, Zach? Mm-hmm. I don't know what that means." Caleb got his hands on a Seiko. And it's apparently some kind of collaboration. Well, oh, it's the it's the Pikachu Seiko. Oh, you know they, Seiko has um, some weird collabs they do with like um, anime characters, uh, like um, Street Fighter, like video games combo. Um, there's some interesting, you know, cross brand collabs. Uh, I think the question was was the question what brand would I like to see collabed? I think. Is that what you said? Uh, yes. What, what weird. collab would I would weird? Well, I mean, the only collaboration, and it's not really a collaboration, that I would like to own is the uh, Omega Speedmaster Silver Snoopy, um, which isn't really a collaboration because it's not a brand with a brand outside of um, of uh, it's it's uh, the most expensive one of those you can find. Uh, let's see. It's uh, there in the middle, in the middle white dial, uh, up, 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 that. That's it. 
Um, and this is a, a NASA sort of, you know, the Silver Snoopy Award is for ingenuity in space flight. And the Omega Speedmaster is associated very, very, very heavily with space flight. And they have a version uh, that is very limited edition. Uh, as you can see, if you're watching the video version of this, this one this is a $25,000 watch, uh, and it's a Speedmaster. You can get a Speedmaster for three grand, and so because this one is a Snoopy version of it, it's uh, it's very very expensive. What's really cool about this, Zach? Are there more photos than this? If you scroll down, are there are there more photos? What's really cool about Silver Snoopy is the loom. When you when you when you go to night. Uh, it's not just the 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 the, the numbers or the loom plots and the needles. Sno the cartoon Snoopy is in loom, and it looks really fucking cool. It's just a badass looking little watch. So not really a collab, um, but uh, but involves it involves. Look at that the case back with the Snoopy on it. I mean, that, that it yeah. rules. So, you know, I'm not that big of a Peanuts fan, but Snoopy as an astronaut, you know. It's pretty fucking oh, cool. Oh, here's the loom. Yeah, you see the loom? See the it's actually the cartoon of Snoopy laying down. It's pretty G. So these are very rare. They're very expensive. Um, but if I, I I think a Charles Schultz peanuts uh, character on the dial of a very serious watch, that's a collab. Yeah, enough. I like that. If there was a Calvin and Hobbes one, I would dig it. You know, right. things impressionable comics from my childhood. In the Rolex sure. world, one of my favorite Rolex collabs is the Domino's Pizza Air King. The fucking pull it up. The Domino's Pizza, uh, Domino's would give Rolex Air Kings with the Domino's logo on them to uh, the their best performing uh, managers. And look at that bad motherfucker right there. I mean, imagine rolling up with the Rolex with a Domino's fucking pizza box on it. People look at you like you're out of your mind. Like, no, nah, that's a real Rolex. Yeah, they'd be like, how many pizzas did you buy to <laughs> yeah. get this knockoff thing? You know, how many proofs of purchase? Yeah, and actually the value has gone up on these. This is 7400 bucks. These things are about 3500 to four grand yeah, a year or two grand. ago. Look, this is nine. Oh, that one's really nice. The one in the box oh, that's 9000 That one looks really clean. So this is a later Domino's one. They stopped putting Domino's on the dial, and instead, look, look on the bracelet. You see the little Domino? On oh, the link, yeah. they put a domino on the link now. I like it on the dial. I don't know about the one on the link. The one on the link's not that cool. Fucking. There's a super cool collab you'll never, ever see for sale, ever. Our My homie, Anthony, works as an animator on South Park. And he's been on the show for, I don't know how many years it is now, but it's, it's at least 15 because as a 15-year thank you gift for working on the show, Trey and Matt gave this dude a Rolex with fucking Cartman on the dial. Oh, wow. It's bad as a motherfucker. It's, it's like one of it's one. It's so cool. And that, that I saw that dude, and he didn't even, he you know, he was into it, he gets it, but he, he didn't want, he wasn't wearing it out, it wasn't like that. And I was just like, you, you just tell me. You tell me when you're ready to fucking put your kid through college. And I got you. Should you should be like, you tell me when you're ready to make $2,000. <laughs> you tell me when you're ready to make $500. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. All right. Uh, oh, another watch. Luis Correa wants to know, thoughts on the premium, the JDM Seiko's uh, carry? Um, it's mostly, yeah, uh, he wants to know if he's missing something because there's minor differences. So Seiko's are made in two places, Japan and Malaysia. Sometimes the ones that are often the ones that are made in Japan are more valuable and more desirable. Uh, sometimes that's because the day wheel alternates between English and Japanese as opposed to English and Spanish, which some of the other ones have or other languages. Um, some some people think the ones that are made in Japan are slightly nicer than the ones made otherwise. You know, you talk about something like a Fender guitar, right? There's a Fender Stratocaster guitar. They make them in several different places. They make the, the, the cheapest ones are made in Mexico. The next level up is actually Japan and then America, but some people really prefer the Japanese ones for different reasons. They sound a little different and blah, 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 you know. Um, the American ones are the most expensive, but some say the Japanese ones are actually the best made, you know? Wow, yeah. And so, um, you know, it's kind of like that. Um, I own three Seikos. All three of them were made in Japan. And that wasn't necessarily intentional, but the Seiko Turtle and the Seiko King Turtle uh, that I bought are were made in Japan. 
but that's it. When I, next time I can go to Japan, I'm I'm bringing a fat fucking stack of yen, and I'm going to spend a whole day finding some fun ass JDM Seikos. That's going to be a thing we do in Japan. Cool. When we can go back. Holy shit! These are all watch questions today. What the fuck is this? Uh, three in a row. Watch customization for my newly acquired Seiko Turtle. And so go to Instagram and go to find Shadow Watchmaker on Instagram or follow Jack Hypoxia on Instagram. I don't know the names of like all the parts and stuff, but I see Shadow Watchmaker's my guy. He's local. He's the guy I use. He's done several builds for me, both fake, vintage, and modern. If you scroll down a little bit, Zach, a little that low one on the left there, the all silver, that's my newest build he did. That's a modern build. So I basically took the turtle parts and upgraded them with higher quality parts. So I created a more modern looking uh, build that's like, I think this is a watch that looks like probably a, there you go, there's a before and after, right? So I think I, I took a watch that was $250 on sale, originally 400, I got it on sale for 250 at Christmas, okay? Then we added the dome sapphire crystal, the black date wheel, changed the hands, uh, changed the bezel, and change the rehote, which is the angled ring around the loom plots. And I think we ended up with a watch that looks like it's around a thousand or twelve hundred for a total investment of around five hundred. Yeah. So man, I that's think nice. that's cool. It does. Yeah. So I don't have any specific. I would say look at builds that the these customizers have done and you can hit them up on Instagram and say, All right, I really like this build, but I want to go with a green bezel. Or and they'll 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 know where to find the parts. If you should give them a direction, they'll be like, ah, okay, here's what you want. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then you do fake vintage or no fake vintage or whatever. Uh, Sebastian McCaskill, most playful all-wheel drive car for under twenty k. Suzuki SX4. Yeah. That's right? supposed to be a great car. Suzuki Never SX4 one. probably, or like a fairly beat Evo 10 beat GSR. Evo. Yeah, A beat Evo will give give you what you want. Yeah. Or buy a beat Subaru and put suspension on it, and that would help a lot. Well, look, Subaru's pushy front end and mushy steering. That's the biggest difference between Evos and Subarus. Evos have really sharp steering. Yeah, quick ratio. And they don't sure. have mushy front ends. They right. have very sharp front ends. So if you can find an Evo get an Evo. Maybe that means importing one. Maybe that means driving on the right-hand side. You Which know what I mean? That's idea. If you want to drive on the right-hand side, your options become very open, you know? Ooh, what about the Pulsar GTI? Uh, oh, yeah, Nissan think, Pulsar yeah. GTI R. I don't know how much I was already import. That would be You can buy them for, eager. like, 18 to 20 from guys like Sean yeah. from Top Rank or whatever. Short wheelbase, hatchback, yeah. all will drive with very SR20. Fun. Might be able to find a Celica GT4. Um, I, don't think, I, I don't think that would have the Christmas that he's looking for. Yeah, maybe not. Yeah, I would say. I mean, find it, find an Evo with miles, but that's maintained well. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, Vlad, oh, this is an interesting question. I like, but don't love my Tesla Roadster. Silent mobbing is good, but it understeers and doesn't tighten on liftoff. I know exactly what you're fucking talking about, dude. A hundred percent. Should I take a 10k loss or hang on to it as a collectible? It's a very interesting question. I would say. Don't sell it yet. The driving dynamics are right. It's basically like a Lotus Elise with a giant heavy backpack on. The battery's in the wrong place. The, the tires aren't right. The weight distribution is terrible. That It's why they don't make cars like that anymore. Having said that, I just saw a listing this morning on Uncrate for a Roadster listed at $90,000. So... I'm not saying hold it for 20 years, but if you've got a nice Roadster, I would hold it for a little while longer mm -hmm. if you can afford to not sell it. Especially because they're going to come out with a new Roadster eventually, which will probably bring more uh, attention to the old right. one. And I bet you're going to have some people out there that want to have a pair. So you might be able to sell yours to someone who bought the new one. Yes. Um, the, the Tesla hype train is not done, I think, is what the point no, is. No, it's not. And I think there's a po the only collectible Tesla, the only collect would be a Roadster. Yeah, for um, sure. The rest of them are just appliance, you know, they're throwaway. They're, they're, whatever you can recycle when you're done with the fucking lease, just recycle it. Um, um, but, but the Roadster actually does have a collectability potential. Jay Leno thinks so. Um, and I would, 
if you can afford to hang on to it for a little while longer, I would definitely watch the market, especially if we're just talking about 10K. If we're talking about 10K, I think you're going to see more than a 10K bump in those in the next year or two. Yeah. Devlin says, should I get an Cadillac ATSV versus an F80 M3? My A8 uh, V5 five has 500 wheel horsepower tune, but the love is starting to fade. So I have videos on both of those cars. Uh, the ATSV, oh my God, is great on paper. My phone is blowing up right now and it's shop phone. Can you, this yeah. is a pause, sorry. Uh, okay, so look, I have videos about to, for Devlin. I have videos about the ATSV and the M3. The ATSV is a nice chassis. It turns in well. The engine makes a lot of power. It sounds horrible. Yeah, it's, it's a horrible sounding car. V6s almost always always do. do. And the ATSV is they were com it was completely ignored in the sound department. Exhausts only make it sound worse. Yeah, and the interior on that thing, especially with Q system, like. Oh, it's, it's just the, the, ah. the interior didn't look good, new. It's, I don't think it's going to age well, yeah, which no. is unfortunate because I think it's a pretty good looking car and it's such a capable car. Yeah. But I, I think the M3 for, for sure. Yeah, right. I agree. Uh, Patrick Short wants to know what car we would choose for the Mongol Rally. I, what is the you know Mongol is? Rally? It's insane. What they drive it? from a London, Mongolia? I think, to Mongolia, and it takes like a month or two. The finish line is open for weeks. What is the What are the rules uh, for cars? I, don't I think know. I don't it has know. to be under fifteen grand US. Uh huh. And you know, you could take like a four. You need some ground clearance because there's places with no yeah. roads. But you also have to think about if something breaks, you're going to be in fifteen different countries or whatever. Right, right, so right. So what parts are available? In those countries. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Land Cruiser, maybe. That's probably a good one. Yeah, I Toyota. Think Mitsubishi or Toyota would be a yeah, good like idea. Yeah, like a Tacoma or some shit. Maybe yeah. old Mercedes stuff. Because maybe. Because those were used in many, diesel? many places. A diesel Mercedes yeah. would probably be the yeah. best bet because yeah. you go through some Eastern European areas, uh, Western European. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, something like that. Or an ass Subaru Outback, maybe. Depends on, I don't know how supportive they are. Like, you go through Turkey. Uh, I don't know what the cars are, are like Yeah, there. but like a, a regular 2.5 non-turbo, you know, it's not Probably something, you gotta, it's not something it. you gotta worry about. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, Kyle B has a 2014 E63 S Mercedes. Uh, are there any cars in the 120 to 130? This is a, I'm sorry, Kyle, but like, come on, buddy. I'm looking for something new. Are there cars you can think of in the 120 to 130K range that will hold value for a couple of years? Nothing this new. <sighs> nothing new ever holds value with the exception of like the 1M. I mean, even if you bought the GT3 RS 4.0, like if you got an early allotment and then flipped it within yeah. six months, you made money, but then yeah. they went down for a bit. I mean, the answer is nothing new, mm -hmm. right? So if we eliminate all new. Now, 120 to 130K used, but flat. We're talking about depreciated Ferraris. We're talking about very lightly used, but older GT Porsches. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not talking about any sedans right. or SUVs. And if you need that, or something you're out. that can be used as a regular car. Almost nothing with an automatic transmission. Um, you're pretty limited. I mean, if you're talking about holding value it's too bad that so many people ask us questions about holding value because they're really preventing themselves from buying good cars and unless um unless you're willing to go to a much older mercedes you know like 70s or 120k 80s. you can get an 07 phantom get a get like an 07 out. phantom bottomed out you're gonna pay the maintenance 07 Phantom looks just like a 2014 Phantom, so you'll be able to sell that shit. What does a hammer cost these days? I know it's not a four door. Like a an old hammer? Yeah. 300K. Okay, never Expensive. Mind. Really expensive. And they're now, the hammers are now past their their value as a driving experience. It's just a museum know. piece at this point. They're beautiful, they're rare, they're cool. But but you know they're they're fundamentally big touring cars and the um, uh, the uh, the 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 uh, the automatic gearbox and the you know it's you know they're they're yeah. old cars so right. they're they're cool you know you want to have one in a collection but it's not uh, that's the problem is nothing he could buy that has bought maybe out a most like a Mulsanne nice. you know like a bet like a V eight a, a V eight turbo Bentley like a Mulsanne or a Brooklyn's. 
Uh, Brooklyn's know, might be bottomed uh, Brooklyn's out. Brooklyn's maybe. Also, might be too new still. Yeah. Yeah. I it's not know. a lot. Not though. a lot. I mean, nothing nothing new you never heard of, certainly. Right. Yeah. Matt says he was given a ladies Rolex diamond date just by a family member to trade in for a first real watch. Uh, recommendations for brands are, mo- I mean, similar in value. Um, Rolex, that could be all, all over the place. If it's steel, you know, it's maybe maybe it's worth like thirty five hundred bucks. If it's gold, maybe it's worth seven or eight thousand. If there's diamonds and stuff, it, it kind of changes. So, if you want to stay in the Rolex family, you might have to throw in a little extra cash on top of it because because like unless you want like a date just, it's not really going to do it for you. Um, Let's see. Assuming, let's call it, you get, let's say you get five grand out of that thing. My favorite watches for five grand are the Omega Speedmaster uh, and the Omega, some versions of the Aqua Terra, which I really like. Um, My, I mean, these, uh, Bremont is offering a whole bunch of different options in the $5,000 range. I've been wearing my World Time for like, I don't know, two weeks now, and it's really grown on me and, and fits my wrist really, really nicely. Um, so Bremont offers a, a great product. Bell & Ross offer a great product. Panerai. You, you're getting into real watches for that kind of money, but without knowing exactly what type of uh, date just, it would be tough to put a value on it. Easiest thing to do, like if you want to fuck with our friends at Crown & Caliber, you know, offer it on trade. You know, if you you get a good you get pretty good value from Crown and Caliber if you offer something on trade and and you see something you want that they uh, that they stock, but uh, yeah, get down with our sponsors, Bremont, dude. They've got these the new shit that just came out. The um, what's the new plane one? The the, the electric like Rolls Royce plane themed one. Oh, the one that uh, Johnny's wearing, right? The Ion yeah, Ion the Bird. Ion Bird. That's what it's called. Titanium. I blanked on the name. Yeah. Ion Bird. It's actually a very, very cool watch. Yeah. The plane looks cool. Great looking watch. 5,700 on strap. On strap. Thank you for your questions. Um, I have to end this show in about 15 minutes because we got cars coming and going. Right, let's do speed round. All right, speed round. Uh, RR. I'm in an Evo 10. Should I get an RS3 or M2 comp? I'm worried about the M2 rear wheel. I mean, okay. If you don't need all wheel, like all wheel drive is completely unnecessary for any vehicle if you're not in deep snow and going up mountains. Yeah. So even if you've had an Evo 10, there's no reason you can't drive a rear wheel drive car all winter if you don't have, if you get the right tires. So that shouldn't really be a concern. Now, in, as long as you keep traction on, if you're worried about the rear wheel drive car getting away from you. That's a personal problem, but I mean, like, if you don't turn traction off and you don't go too crazy, it's a totally, it's an easy car to drive. If you turn those systems off, like, it will do a burnout rolling in third gear because it makes, like, 440 horsepower. So, I mean, it's a fantastic car. Just yeah. just be smart about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say, yeah, if, you have a, if, you're, if you're worried about learning to drive rear-wheel drive, that's a solvable you problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that means that you should go learn how to drive rear wheel drive because you have that opportunity. So don't be afraid of it. Right, just approach it intelligently, and don't put a tune on that car before learning to drive rear nope. wheel drive because that will just make the surge worse. You certainly don't need. Uh, to do Jack that. has an easy question. I drive a manual Mark Six Jetta. I want coilovers, but I don't want to mess up the drivability because I drive on bad roads every summer. I'm paraphrasing. Do I put it on coilovers or get new stock struts? Stock struts are totally fine if you want your car to ride great. Coilovers are what you make of them. You can get coilovers and put them in a comfort setting and set your ride height at a stock ride height. And what you've got is a car that looks and drives stock, but with a much higher quality shock. So you'll actually have improved body control Mm -hmm. and the car will feel nicer and more refined and more expensive. Uh, You could also adjust it a little bit for a little bit lower ride height without totally ruining it. Um, But you could also fucking ruin it. but it won't be the hardware that does that. It'll be the decisions that you make. So my advice would be, even if you want to install those parts yourself, take them to a reputable alignment and setup shop, tell them how you want to drive, tell them your concerns, and they will set them appropriately. Mm-hmm. And then you'll be good. 
Spencer O'Hara, thank you for your donation. I appreciate that. Uh, does one track day a month in the E92 M3 manual and loving it? Is it a good platform to invest in and mod, or should I have a different save to have a different experience in the future? Like I mean, Porsche. if you were going to have a BMW to drive fast in, an E92 M3 is a pretty fucking good one. Yeah, Alex Bernstein, you know, photographer, mm -hmm. he has gone through several BMW eras like he's owned a bunch all of them immediately turn into track cars like yeah. he was setting records in his 135 and then he sold it and now he has an e92 which he said he was going to keep as a street car and right. i think it was three weeks later that he was bolting on suspension pulling out the interior so follow him on instagram at bernou b-e-r-n-o-o -O, and maybe one more o but like he loves it. I mean, yeah. it's a great platform, and you just need to lighten it up a bit, which he did, and, I mean, it's killing it. Yeah, they're a lot of fun to drive. I just, I don't like the stock seating position, but that's a me problem, and it's an easily fixable one. Um, I think as a buy and hold, they are going to hold their value very well because of the V8, mm -hmm. because it's such a great engine, the naturally aspirated, yeah, because it, it looks Oof. good. It's generally universally agreed on to be a good-looking, good-driving, good-sounding car. Yeah. Even the DCT is fine. It's not bad. Yeah, it's not. Um, and, you know, you've got the rod bearing thing, which is like the IMS. It's a thing that you need to solve and then document. But long term, great car. But should I save to have a different experience in the future? You need to decide at what point you are that you've had that experience. If it's track days, maybe it's a great lap, you know, maybe you just get tired of putting money into the car. Maybe it's you get to a point where either you have to put a lot more money or try something else, and then maybe you try something else. But um, if you like the car now, 10 track days isn't that many. And if you're having fun with it, I would I would stick with it. Yeah. If the you only, like it now, modifying it will probably, if you do it right, will make you like it more. Yeah. And what's good about that car and modifying it is because it's N.A., it's easy to resist the urge to just go more boost, more power. You kind of have to do other shit yeah. because it's so expensive to make more power in that car. Good point. You might as well just say fuck it and do other stuff, and then your durability is not really affected yeah. because yeah. you're not stressing the engine out. I like that. Uh, Nainoa has an 04 R32 uh, and totally stock. Should you keep it or sell it? I don't know. You need the money? Do you owe anybody money? Do you need drogas? We means power? <laughs> Why would you sell it? I don't know. Keep When someone says to me, should I keep this or sell it? I don't know. If you have all the money in the world, assume, I mean, like, is, is an 04 R32 a collectible Volkswagen? Yes. Is it appreciating at a rate? that the cost of keeping it around, caring for it, insuring it, all of these things is going to uh, somehow you're going to net positive. Is appreciation outpacing that. Fuck right. to the no. Right. Fuck to the no. There's how, also how many miles does your car have? What condition right. is it in? Right, right. Is, I mean, do you have a good one or is it kind of, you know, haggard? Right. Yeah. A lot of right. questions there. Agreed. I, I completely agree. Um, a lot of things that, that matter. They pull good money. Volkswagen fans like them. You know, it's a classic shape. It mm -hmm. looks good. It sounds good. You know, they, they're going to be a strong hold yeah. as a drivable car that, you know, really has a floor. And le that, the floor of one of those is like 25K unless it's yeah. fucked. But I don't know what the difference is between a 25K one and a 100K one, but I ain't never seen a 100K one. No, I think you know? I saw one on Bring Each Other a few months ago that was like 50 and so, that was probably the it, nicest one right, ever, it's right? Low mile, blue, right. perfect, et cetera, right. et cetera. Right. And there's enough of them around that you're not going to get the feeding frenzy like you got for that Civic SI. Civic SI went for 50 grand because no one's ever seen a fucking low mile Civic SI since. Right. People bought R32s new and then kept them nice. Yeah. So you see them around. They come up. You know what I mean? So it was a collectible from new. Bought True. by collectors, as opposed to a Civic Si, which was bought by high school kids and then burned by fucking cholos, and then now they're coming and then turned into lemons cars. Right. You know, yeah. now People they're racing. now we, they're we back did. around. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, so so it, that's why those are bringing huge money. Um, and I don't I don't see that with the R32, but they're solid holds if you enjoy owning and driving an R32. But please, guys, stop dwelling on the, the future value of your cars. We're talking about small money. 
I'm not. I can't predict the next ginormous fucking spike. I just can't. It's probably not the car. None of the cars we're talking about here. It's probably something you don't even think about how you don't see them anymore. Right. Well, because you know, because the, the market moves. You know. Yeah, but um, it's it's uh, um, uh, scouting for Zen cloth. One word answer: cloth. Hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, gravity drift. Bro, you're asking what are the tr- must-drive tracks in Southern California? Oh, There's all three. <laughs> There's Willow Springs and the Sub Willows, Button Willow and its co- various configurations, Chuck Walla, Thermal, Thermal and Fontana. And Fontana. Yeah. Sorry, there's five, excuse me. They're oh, all and they're all those are them. pretty different. They're all say. pretty different and they're all pretty fun. If you're just a driver, and almost every single one of them, except Chuck Walla, will cause massive damage to your car if you go off. Yeah. Yep. 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 Very good point. But yeah, and I mean, it's not like what are the must drives? Like, there's five, all of them. It's not like, uh, it's not like Northern California. We've got more. Actually, there's not that many in Northern California either, right? There's really only like five. Uh, there's Laguna, Sears Point, and Thunder Hill, which has two two tracks yeah. conf- to technically add it. Al, uh, Altamont, not really. Is, I don't know. What that that was is. Like, a, like some shithole up there. I think um, there's three up north. Is that, I guess there's yeah, not that many. The either. Ones, yeah, right? used to, yeah. All right. Well, okay. All of them. All the California tracks we recommend. Yeah, not trying to be snarky, good. but there's just not that many. It, you, you can, can kind of just all. decide how fast you want to go. Fontana and Big Willow are both very fast, yeah. you know, risky pl- kind of places. Right. Streets is slower. Streets is slower. Thermal's slower. Chuckwalla, Button Willow are about the same. Medium yeah. fast. Medium. Chuckwalla has the bowl, which yeah. you can go, you know, which is interesting in the yeah. back straight. But yeah, they're medium. Yeah. And they just repave Chuckwalla. So. All right. Well, that's going to be our show because I, I predict a shit show happening here at WCCS. We got cars coming in. We got cars going out. I got to get some fucking Forerunner off the thing. This guy's calling me. I'm just going to end it here. Tradecraft Farms. Hit them up. Follow them on Instagram. That's our, that's our Gange sponsor. We love you all. Thanks for donating. Have a great weekend. We'll see you later. Bye.